welcome to another week of Antidote Stories in Medicine. This is Christine. This week, we are back at Innova Loudon. I am so happy to be welcomed out here again. Everyone loved the music therapy episode. So now we are going back more to the roots of this podcast. We are going to be talking about some great EMS skills, some great trauma cases, and some really innovative stuff that is going on with Innova Loudon and Loudon County Fire Rescue. So today, to talk about the Factor program, I have Dr. John Morgan, Operational Medical Director for Loudoun County Combined Fire and Rescue System, and Stephanie Basie. She is a nurse and trauma program manager for Innova Loudoun Hospital. Guys, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. And Stephanie, we were just talking off air about your multiple credentials. So I said a nurse, but of course, also MSN, CCRN, TCRN, and you were telling me about all these crazy critical care trauma certs you have. Yes. So the most recent one was the trauma certified um, registered nurse certification. It just came out about three or four years ago. The great thing about this certification, it actually talks about pre-hospital um, when the patient gets injured all the way until they go to rehab. So it's a very well diverse uh, exam just for trauma patients in general, because we don't just look at trauma patients from the beginning of their care. It's a continuum of their care until their rehab. And we also do injury prevention and community outreach with our pre-hospital hospital group to make sure that we can try to lower the trauma cases, <laughs> but we also have to care for those trauma cases that actually still happen. Sure. But it's a great certification if anyone wants to do it. Um, you do have to have two years of nursing, in, uh, especially in trauma or trauma center. So it's a great one to go to, and it's just new. And um, the background of the CCRN, I'm just ICU trained, so that's why I have it. But thank you for asking. <laughs> so how long have both of you been working in emergency medicine, respectively? How did you guys get into this? So I started out volunteering as an EMT in college. Ah, okay. Mid yeah. Mid 90s, just to get a little bit of exposure to the medical field. I knew I was interested in medicine and healthcare, and that's where I got my start yeah. and stuck with it through medical school and then did a residency in emergency medicine in California and been practicing as an emergency physician since 2003 in the Northern Virginia area. But I've always had an interest in EMS since early on yeah. and had done some. EMS work here and there and became the medical director for the county uh, shortly after I got uh, to a position uh, working in the emergency department here at Innova Loudoun uh, 15 years ago. So actually now 16 years that I've been in, in the position here. So that's my, a little bit about my background. Yes. Um, my background, I had many backgrounds, but when I got into the <laughs> medical field, um, my mom is a nurse, an ER nurse, and then my father is a physician. So it was kind of in the blood. Um, the reason I went to the ICU route was because at the current time, my mother was the clinical director for the emergency room. So my other choice of going to critical care was to go to the ICU. <laughs> and then when I moved up here and I started working for Innova for almost, what am I, like almost 15 years. Oh, wow. I'm homegrown through Inova. I was a clinical tech at Fairfax and then in their trauma ICU. And then I ended up transitioning to being a nurse and they helped me go through that and all the way up to my master's, which was nice. So when I did trauma, it was great. I came out here and they, at that time, Inova Loudon did not have a trauma center. So I was working in the ICU and then a couple years later, they became a trauma center. So I I was very happy to become the trauma program manager at the time. And it's been great. And the other thing I do here with uh, pre-hospital, because we do a lot of community outreach, is that I'm the clinical um, EMS clinical coordinator here for Loudoun County Fire Rescue for Innova. So we work very closely with our pre-hospital in general as a whole. So it was kind of nice to work on this program that we're going to talk about today to kind of help the community as a whole together. So before we get into the Factor program, which is fascinating, and I actually found out about it months ago through a GEMS article, and I actually shared this to the Facebook group as well, so you all may have seen this, but what does Inova County look like as far as EMS? How big is it? How many resources do you have? ALS versus BLS? Mm -hmm. What do you guys run? So Loudoun County uh, is a, a combination system, meaning combination career volunteer. It grew out of an all-volunteer fire and EMS system over the years, but as the county has grown in population quite explosively, Loudoun was number one and two for many years in terms of population growth year over year. Oh, wow. Through... Uh, Pretty much the time I started in 2003 through through the 2000s, the, the growth has just been explosive um, as people have uh, moved into the D.C. area for jo 
jobs, et cetera. So we are uh, a relatively young county and therefore relatively healthy in terms of uh, problems of that, that come with typically with aging. Mm-hmm. But uh, we run about 20,000 EMS transports a year. The county itself is roughly almost is right around 400,000 population, but we are a combination system with some very robust volunteer organizations that support our function that are actually critical to our uh, success. Predominantly nights and weekends staffing for the volunteers. Obviously, yeah. most people who volunteer in EMS also have sort of a, a day job of sort. Yeah. And and then the career side more supplements the Monday through Friday day side uh, operations. But there's there's quite a mix. And it's an interesting challenge as an EMS physician to work with those two groups of individuals. And ultimately, my job is to make sure that really they're all held to the same standard of performance. Right. You know, we, we train the same and I oversee the the, the paramedic training programs, EMT training programs for, for both groups. We have classes that have both career providers and volunteer providers in the same classroom with the same instructors. And so I think that's a nice example of uh, even though some, some folks are paid and some are not, they're all professionals um, and they all are held to the same standard in terms of their performance. The community expects that. And you know, when someone calls 911, they don't really think about all the, the behind the scenes right. stuff that goes yeah. into a group of men and women standing in front of them there to help. They just know they need help and they want dedicated professional people to show up and, and do a good job. And so we want to make that be very, very unapparent to the to the casual observer. So I think most folks in this in the community don't really understand, even the ones that live here, how it all works behind the scenes. Right. But I think that's a good good thing that that they, they see the end result of their service and the excellence that's provided. Yeah. So that's a little bit about you know the system that we're in. Yeah, I remember from my days that the nights and weekends were usually when you had some of the most critically sick people. <laughs> some of those big traumas were happening then. Yep. So Absolutely. those volunteer providers definitely need to be on their game just as much as the career providers. And do you staff all ALS ambulances, or are they a mix of? Be- they're all ALS. No, they're not. Oh, yeah. We do okay. we do have a tiered system with both BLS uh, ambulance transports with EMT level only, and then we have uh, paramedic uh, involvement as well. And we're also dipping our toe in the water a little bit with the advanced EMT certification, which is sort of a newer. Yeah, it's a nice intermediary. Yeah, it be, it used to be called intermediate. <laughs> right. So we we historically have had a lot of intermediates. Uh, the intermediate certification kind of uh, is phasing out in the country yeah. nationally. But the bottom line is, it, it's a heck of a lot of work to become a paramedic and to stay proficient as a paramedic. Yeah. And my personal opinion is, the more paramedics you have, you kind of dilute out the skill set a little bit. You know, there's only so many invasive procedures to go around in any given county on any given day. And you want people at the paramedic level to get frequent touch time right. for those skills like intubation, airway management, or right. other invasive things. And having a, a smaller but core group of, of highly qualified paramedics uh, is the vision I have to, to try to maybe expand the base of advanced EMTs a bit more. So we're, that's something we're moving towards in our system as well. And there's a lot of calls that don't need the paramedic level of intervention. They need fluids and the advanced or intermediate level, and they would be very well managed with that. It's just very interesting to see something that's more, you said it's not a rural area, but it's a larger, not a dense urban population. And just talking about skills, I mean, when I I worked in a very, very urban, low-income area, and it was like one coat a week at the BLS level, which is probably not what most... (laughs) professionals get. So how long are your response times when you're managing that patient? How long do they have to be responsible for them? It varies a lot. Uh, Loudoun County is a really interesting county geographically. Um, The way we're situated in Northern Virginia, relatively close to Washington, D.C., you know, Dulles International Airport is in Loudoun County. It sits right yeah. between Loudoun and Fairfax. So our eastern end towards the Fairfax and D.C. area is quite dense and getting more dense. We've added things like Metro Rail. A lot of very high-density housing is going into that. To the western half, our western border borders the Appalachian Trail. And so you go from very dense, almost urban setting uh, in issues to ex- extremely remote, limited yeah. access situations where the only way out is being hoisted uh, by a helicopter by the National Park Service, and so and, and everything in between. And so it creates some real challenges when you're trying to standardize an EMS system with your responses 
uh, which are going to be obviously very different yeah. in a dense urban setting than they are in a rural setting. So we do have some response times that are on the longer side, but not exceptionally long like you get in some parts of the United States where you have you know, extreme remote situations. We, we are relatively fortunate in our a- access. And so the long end of our transports would be in the 30 minute time frame. Yeah. But, but certainly a lot of we're, we're, we have a lot of great resources hospital wise in the region. So many of our transports are quite short as well. Uh, you know, five ten minutes uh, in, in many cases. So there's a spectrum there. Yeah. And so we have to be prepared for the differences in terms of patient needs, depending on proximity to a hospital in general or yep. a trauma center. We also have freestanding ERs, which are, are an interesting creation. Yeah, I saw that. I was which actually is... hired in 2003 because they had just opened a freestanding ER at that time um, because the existing hospital, Nova Loudon, was uh, built and as soon as it opened was basically over capacity because of all this growth in the county. And so they reopened the emergency department of an older hospital that had been there for many years as a standalone and basically staffed it with board certified emergency physicians such as myself and had full lab and CAT scan abilities. And at that time, that was a relatively unique model. This was 16 years ago. And incorporating that into the EMS practice in terms of, well, what patients are appropriate to bring to right. a freestanding emergency department. protocols, yeah. You know, if you know someone's going to need operative management of something, probably not worth taking a pit stop at the freestanding and continue on into the right. full, full hospital. And those were some interesting decisions and discussions we had early on in figuring out what was appropriate for this. And if you look at freestanding emergency departments around the country, they really have kind of grown up a lot, exploded, you know, in some areas. Um, and some are treated more like an urgent care in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, EMS doesn't bring patients there at all. Ours, on the contrary, we take a lot of EMS volume um, there and very specific exclusion criteria of things that should not go there. But for the most part, we've had a good working relationship with uh, EMS and serve as a vital part of the EMS system um, with both the hospital-based emergency department and the freestanding. I could ask you a million questions about just the general p- policies and how you guys are running, but I really want to talk about the factor program. So this came out after a particularly difficult call. Is that correct? And a extended extrication? What does FACTOR stand for? Yep. So FACTOR stands for Field Available Component Transfusion Response. So component being blood components. Okay. And part of the FACTOR program is we are looking at component therapy, meaning not whole blood, but sure. pack cells, platelets, and plasma, all three. So the three components that together make up whole blood. So that's how we got the acronym FACTOR. And yes, so we had in Loudoun County a large-scale incident in late 2017 where a family of five was uh, in, a, in a vehicle accident with a full-size school bus that had been converted into a food truck. And oh, they God. were basically T-boned by this vehicle. Uh, their vehicle was pushed by the by the bus up against a guardrail, and then the bus ran up and over it. Oh, and my literally God. ended up on top of it. And so they were obviously heavily entrapped. Yeah. Uh, and one individual, the, the driver, uh, the mother of the family, was unfortunately killed in the mm-hmm. accident. But the other four victims in the car were alive, and the, the extrication was technically very challenging and took a long time, uh, took in excess of three hours. Wow. Okay. So we had, because of the location and the entrapment, we had brought in air medical resources. We had brought in uh, helicopters for each of the patients. Four helicopters were landed and staged near the scene with the anticipation that once these folks who were critically injured were extricated, they would be brought to regional trauma centers. And just to pause, what is ANOVA Loudon as far as the level of trauma center and what are your trauma center resources for these patients? Yeah. So Inova Loudon is a level three trauma center. Mm -hmm. Trauma centers are one, two, and three, with one being the highest um, and three being, uh, there is a slightly lower designation. There's fours and fives They're pretty rare. So most of your one, twos, and threes. So uh, three is is sort of the kind of the entry level uh, trauma center designation. Yeah. It's It's more mechanism of injury. Someone had, was kicked by a horse or someone fell down stairs or there was something, but there's really, truly no obvious injury and then they're hemodynamically so their blood pressure and vital signs are normal um they could be slightly altered but you're really not looking at those high acuity traumas all trauma centers in the state of virginia have to be ready for any trauma so if something does happen and they come through our door no matter if they're high acuity and they have a lot of blood bleeding out and they're really low we still have to try
try to stabilize them and treat them and then we would fly them to another center. Right. So trauma centers have to be ready to what comes through your door. It's just what usually comes from pre-hospital. But um, as we all know, everything doesn't come from pre-hospital. People walk in. Oh, yeah. So you kind of have to go with what you need to. But the standard is, is all trauma centers have to be able to stabilize in the emergency room. And then your level ones and level twos are your high tiers where we would uh, transport from a three to them. But one of our big components is is trying to stabilize in that ED. So the definitive care does not have to be at that hospital. It can be transferred. I know our goal is in the future is to become a level two so we can be able to keep everything in everyone, um, trauma patients inside the county. So we are currently working on that to achieve that goal. Obviously, the, the, a lot of the decision making of where a patient goes depends on what your resources are as a region. Right. And so there are places where the only thing around for many, many, many miles might be a two or a three trauma center, and they're going to get all the trauma. Right. And it's going to get brought there and stabilized and potentially tr- uh, you know, transferred out as, as appropriate. In our region, we have, uh, we're fortunate, we have a few different locations. We have two level two trauma centers, one level one, um, and mm-hmm. us as the level three at Inova Loudoun, just in Northern Virginia, obviously Washington, D.C. And, and Baltimore shock trauma. There, there are many other options as well by air. So we have options and, and, and it, it's, it's good and it's bad for the EMS providers. It makes things more complicated because <laughs> they're often trying to figure out, OK, yes. I'm right in the middle of three different hospitals with different capabilities. It's a kid or it's an adult or they're this, this right. injured or that injured. Where do I go? Or then the patient's going, no, no, no they have to go to this hospital, right. which was something we would always. So we try to we try to support them with some decision making tools that are relatively simple and common sense and at the end of the day you know give them feedback in terms of the decisions they make in a supportive way yeah. as they try to do right by their patients which is ultimately the, the most important thing so how far away were these patients from the level one trauma center you were trying to get them to be flown to yeah so by ground um, they would probably be about a 35 minute drive that's a long drive for yeah. a critical patients it could be so, longer in traffic yeah, right and so the idea is when these folks are are pinned part of the part of the delay in getting air medical resources is you know waiting for the helicopter to do a weather check and and you know get get off the ground and find the appropriate landing zone and land so when they're pinned in the vehicle they're not going anywhere for a while some right. of those delay factors on the front end are as important and then once they're out we really want them evacuated as soon as possible yeah so we do tend to use more helicopter resources in in situations especially in our more rural parts of our county when somebody is trapped versus is if it's if they're not and we can extricate them very quickly let's just get them in the ambulance and get going down the road to the trauma center yeah that's that tends to how we look at it. and of course looking at the overall scale of their injuries and whether they they need that level right. of uh, evacuation that was the background of this particular call so it's taking three hours for them to be extricated I imagine this is a hugely technical fire department response for just the extrication and getting them out. You were at the scene, is that correct? Yes. So I I was requested to the scene because they were trapped and they're basically to provide support as an EMS physician to the operations that were happening, both on the technical rescue side to support the team, but also for any potential issues with the, 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 the patients mm-hmm. in terms of things that may exceed the scope of a paramedic. There yeah. are certain interventions as an EMS physician that I have in my toolbox that our paramedics don't. And for the most part, our men and women who are paramedics or EMTs, they are empowered to do everything they need to do 99.9% of the time. And so mostly I'm there as a support role for them. But there's a few things I can bring to the table if need be in terms of uh, you know some additional interventions that, do they that do might be needed. chest tubes to your medics? They do not do chest okay. tubes. They could do needle needle decompression, yeah. um, but sir, ch- chest tube might be a be an example of that or, or other invasive procedures. Sure. So you decide that you're administering blood while they're entrapped because you had mentioned you had some blood on the helicopters. Is that right? That's correct. So we had four patients, four helicopters, and and each of those helicopters actually carried a limited amount of blood with them, and it was being used uh, on these folks uh, and. The concern was, given the length of the extrication time that we were anticipating, that we were going to exhaust that blood supply on the scene, and we're going to run out. And the, they were sick enough in a hemorrhagic shock that we were uh, wanting to potentially look at other options in terms of what we could do to bring more resources in terms of blood to that scene. So what does that decision-making process look like? When do you realize we don't have enough blood? What are we going to do? Because this is very much outside the box, and EMS is so 
protocol based. And right. as a physician, you don't have to follow those as much. But for the EMS world, it's you have what you have and you can't really go outside that. So how do you break out of that protocol box of response? So it was it was a suggestion by one of our deputy chiefs on scene named Micah Kiger, who, who said, hey, doc, you know, what do you think about asking the hospital if they can send more blood? And at the time, it, it, it was sort of one of those, yeah, let's give it a shot type of type of decisions. Sure. We knew the extrication was was uh, going to take some more time and that the resources we had were, were running out. And so it really was the only other alternative we had other than just let's use more normal saline on folks, which there's which a lot is, of evidence is, yeah. is not a good mm-hmm. idea yeah. in trauma. Yeah, limit that as much as you can. And so so we were we really didn't have a lot of choices. And so I agreed that it sounded like an option, although I was not sure it was going to work because <laughs> as an emergency physician working in the hospital setting, I know there's a lot of regulation uh, and restrictions in terms of the blood bank and, and releasing blood even to the emergency room in an right. emergency. Paperwork, things to sign, uh, you know, phone calls to make and... to tell people, yes, this is what we need. And so I wasn't, I kind of gave it a 50-50 shot of us yeah. actually getting blood to come from the hospital uh, because we really didn't have a plan for that in place. It's not anything we'd ever done before. Or, so I just didn't know. But, you know, never hurts to ask. And so game time decision. I called one of my colleagues in the emergency department who was working and said, hey, this might sound a little crazy, but uh, here's my situation. And I was wondering if maybe you can work with me to, you know, call up the blood bank and see if they'd be willing to release blood uh, to this incident for for ongoing uh, resuscitative efforts here. And that's that was it. The request was made. And then I hung up the phone and went back to work with the, the crews on scene. And at some point, it was hard to keep track of time, but cooler blood showed up. It just <laughs> appeared. It just appeared. And I was the like, blood well, fairy. That, that worked. It's got a little so mosquito on him. It was, uh, it was kind of a, an interesting moment uh, and, and <laughs> I think made an impact in the outcome ultimately. And so it was a uh, an opportunity for us to review what took place and then maybe make that as a more formalized program if we had a similar incident you know, in the future. How much blood showed up? How much did you end up using on these patients? So off the top of my head, I don't recall exactly. <laughs> I think we got, um, we ended up actually getting blood from two different hospitals. Oh, okay. And so we ended up having more than we needed, <laughs> which is a good problem to have. Yeah, that's rare in EMS. It is. And and so um, I actually don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head of how much was used. But the nice thing about the way the blood is packaged is that the individual bags of blood have temperature monitors on them so they can tell if the blood stays within spec in terms of not getting too warm. Mm-hmm. So you keep it in the cooler, keep the cooler closed, and there's ice in there. So the blood actually is able to be returned to the hospital blood bank for use on another patient. So even though we had maybe more than we needed, it wasn't necessarily wasted. Right. It was used, some of it, and that whatever wasn't could be returned to the blood bank as long as it stays within spec and is still safe to be used. Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, you you mentioned before that there's not many other agencies doing this. I mean, flight medics will or and flight nurses will carry blood with them, RBCs, platelets, you know, plasma, but no one's bringing blood to an extrication. This is the first time it's being done in the United States, or at least that's what the GEMS article told me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so cool. I mean, like many things with EMS, a lot of uh, the innovation is coming through experiences with military medicine. Yep. And forward deployed blood has been a big thing in, in, in the military for some time. And that is now starting to, to appear more in, in the civilian world for EMS. Yeah. Starting really with helicopters and, and they obviously, they tend to be dispatched to some of the worst of the worst in terms of trauma. And so our local air medical providers have been carrying blood for a little while, for a year and a half, a couple of years. At this point, at the time of this accident, they've probably been doing it for almost a year. And so that was a good resource. And so there are other agencies, predominantly air medical around the country that are carrying uh, blood. Uh, there's, there is an, an, at least one that I know of in Texas uh, that's carrying blood forward deployed, again, on their EMS ground, EMS transport or, or EMS supervisor vehicle units. But this is a different kind of program because we're not actually carrying the blood in the ambulances or right. our supervisor vehicles. The blood's staying in the blood bank. And so we don't have to, on the fire rescue, the EMS side, we don't have to deal with all the oversight and regulation and equipment and upkeep and, and costs associated with maintaining a blood supply in a forward deployed fashion. We're requesting it on an as-needed basis. So the startup costs are less and, and the complexity is less. The downside being there's a transport piece that when we need it, 
uh, we have to recognize that we're on a situation where, okay, I'm going to anticipate this is a situation where I have somebody who's critically injured. They're trapped and they're probably going to be trapped for at least 25, 30 minutes because that's how long it takes to get the blood. And and they have injuries that are potentially survivable. We don't want to just activate this if somebody's got right. a devastating head injury, it's going to be fatal. Right. But we're what we've taught is our providers to, to recognize these scenarios as soon as possible so that we can start the ball rolling. And it starts with them recognizing it and then they, they call me as an EMS physician. And so I do the sort of the gatekeeper role of, okay, tell me what, what the situation is. What do you have? Uh, gender, because that matters in terms of what right. type of blood mm -hmm. we're giving. Right. And then I do a quick, quick assessment of, yep, this is the right, the right thing to do. And then I'll call the, I'll personally call the blood bank and activate the process. And so that's how we've, we've set it up to, to proceed. So how did the program get created after this massive incident? Did you come back and say, let's standardize this? And how do you train medics to give blood? I mean, that's a, that's a nurse thing usually, right? That's what you learn in nursing school. Yeah, it is. As a, as an emergency physician, my uh, understanding of how blood gets given uh, was typically, you know, I either order write it. an order or type an order <laughs> into the electronic medical uh, <laughs> record system and it and it happens. And so the yeah. decision-making part piece I own, the actual administration and certainly all the behind the scenes stuff that happens with the blood bank was all new to me as a physician. I didn't have much knowledge about uh, blood donor services and, and how that all, all that, that functions. And so it was, it was very interesting. Essentially what happened is my counterpart in Fairfax County, which is a county to the east, Dr. Abstray, and I talked about this incident and we agreed that this was something that we wanted to try to formalize. And so we partnered together because between Loudoun and Fairfax, we serve about 1.5 million individuals, residents. It's a, you know, right. large That's a big area. section of Northern Virginia. And so again, this particular incident, this was the first time we'd done anything like this. So the odds of it happening tomorrow are remote. But collectively, as a region of North Virginia, where not just Fairfax Loudoun, but the entire entirety of North Virginia, we serve a lot of people. And on an annual basis, I bet there could be a couple incidents that this would be worthwhile, whether that's a structural collapse or a, a terrible you know, accident with, with entrapment like we were faced with. Um, so this isn't an everyday occurrence, but we, right. we saw the need. And we also felt that having done it once you know, on the fly, if it's going to happen again, if there's a system or process in place, it'll go smoother. We'll be able to get the blood faster. We'll have the proper equipment for our, mm -hmm. our EMS transport unit in terms of blood warmers and the training, as you mentioned, involved as well. So we took about, the incident was in September of 2017, and we went live with the program in January of 2019. So it took a little over a year of planning, discussions, working very closely with hospital partners, the blood bank, you know. Lawyers obviously get involved yeah. at some point when you're <laughs> talking about things that are a little different than people are getting used to. So it took some, you know, some discussions and negotiations in terms of working through the, the challenges and logistics, training, equipment purchase. But at the end of the day, it was a really wonderful partnership with a lot of different stakeholders in the region. The hospital partners, the blood bank and blood donor services, the community. We ended up getting a lot of the equipment for the EMS uh, crews donated by community organizations um, who saw the need and the ben benefit yeah. of a program like this. Our regional EMS council, the North Virginia EMS council was a partner in that as well. So it really brought a lot of stakeholders together and pretty much universally, everybody was like, you know, this just makes sense. It's a good idea. Yeah. It's going to potentially help save lives. And so even though it's not something that's a typical way that we use blood from the hospital blood services, um, the vision, let's make it happen. You know, we did it once, you know, it, it seemed to help. Nothing bad happened. So let's make a more formal process for it. And, and hopefully we'll see uh, a more benefit if there's another incident in the future. I'm sure it was much easier to convince people to get on board when you already had this successful example of it. Right. This wasn't just some, you know, out of the blue idea that I had one day. Let's see if it works. We did it. And then it was more of an after action review of, okay, that happened happened. What do we learn from this? Yeah. And this was a tragic incident. Family affected was was obviously devastated by the yeah. impact on, on them. Um, but they were very supportive of it as well in terms of wanting to see something good and positive come out of their tragedy. And so I think it, it was meaningful for them as well to to see, you know, something that could benefit others come from that event. And and for our providers too. You know, these incidents where there's a fatality are, are very difficult for the first responders involved. We had yes. over 50 fire rescue personnel on this incident mm. helping in one way or another. And they were all, you know, deeply impacted. And I think it's it's very meaningful for them to see something good come of something so sad and so tragic. Because it, you know, firefighting EMS is a, is a difficult job and is very stressful. 
And um, we see a lot of tragedy and feeling that we can have some power and some control to, to make good of, of tragic situations, I think is very, it gives hope. Yeah. And those extended extrication calls are always the most difficult because you're pausing that go response you get in EMS where you're in there, you wrap them and you leave and you hand them off. But there you're sitting there watching someone suffer for a long period of time. So I'm sure knowing, OK, we've got more blood coming, we're doing all this stuff was helpful for them to feel you know, that they were making a difference for these patients because it's it's really hard to deal with trauma day in and day out, much less that kind of significant trauma. Absolutely. So what kind of training do your EMS providers go through to learn how to give blood? If someone joins your service, what's the course? So we we recognize, I recognize that giving blood is, is it's relatively straightforward and simple procedurally, but there's a lot of little <laughs> bits and pieces that are very important. Yes. Um, and <laughs> I'm a big believer in in trying to keep things as simple as possible. And at the end of the day, we decided to give the, the specific training on the administration of blood to a smaller core group of our EMS supervisors, our EMS uh, captains, who, it. you know, recognizing that there's an inherent delay of when this blood's going to get to the scene based on how we've set things up. So they're going to be there. You know, even if they're out of position when the call comes in, by the time the blood shows up, they should be. They drive very quickly. They're good at that. Right, right. <laughs> And they go, the to, you know, they go to the worst <laughs> of the worst calls. Right. And so we have two EMS supervisors on duty 24-7. And they're, they're serving a 520-square-mile area of the county, which is a large oh. geographic area. Yeah. But they, they – so we trained that group. So we're talking 12, 13 individuals who got the, the core intense training, really hands-on, how to use the warmers – transfusion reactions, all, all that, you know, educational uh, knowledge. And we worked with the hospital's uh, emergency department uh, educational Education. personnel to provide that because we said, well, who's the experts on hanging blood? Not not Dr. Morgan, you know. Yeah. Again, I just order it and it happens <laughs> magically. We, we need the, the trauma nurses who are really the subject matter experts who deal with this process day in and day out to really come in and, and give us the true, the, the real answers in terms of, you you know, how likely are we to see a major transfusion reaction? And, you know, transfusion reactions, a lot of the, the bad ones, which are rare, fortunately, extremely rare, the, 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 the symptoms often mimic what you would see in a crashing trauma patient who's bleeding out. Right. He's shocked hypotension, you know, respiratory distress, all these things are going to be like really tough to distinguish between what's happening from the blood I'm hanging versus the individual who is severely traumatized. And especially it's different to observe all of these things when you're in a car that's crushed and it's probably at nighttime right. and right. it's much easier in an ER right. or a floor. And there are certain things like, you. you know, that just aren't practical. Well, let's take a temperature every 15 minutes and, you know, we're not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So they, I don't think I ever had a thermometer on my ambulance. Right, right. So we we tried to provide an education that was realistic in terms of, okay, we'd like to have the following and, and, but, you know, consent, you know, consent for blood is a big thing in the hospital setting. Um, but in this situation, for the most part, we're going to assume that these folks are in a state where they lack capacity to provide consent for blood. And so it's going to be, have to be done under more of an emergent circumstances. But we, we, you know, we had to address all these things. For our system at whole, we provided more of an awareness training. Uh, we produced a video that goes over the background of the program, how we got here with Factor, and, and goes through some of the particulars of, of blood administration. But for the for their EMS system at large, what we really wanted to focus on was the recognition. How do I recognize right. when I've got a patient who I may be the very first, uh, you know, first responder on this on this scene on a fire fire engine with uh, you know limited EMS experience? How do I recognize a situation where I might need to to call Dr. Morgan and say, hey, I, I think I've got a situation that's going to need the blood program. So that's what we focused on for the, the system at large and for our ALS members, recognizing that they're going to, they could end up being in that support role. So the MSO supervisor being the subject matter expert on administration, they're going to need a second set of qualified hands to help with right. vascular access, IV, IO, as well as actual administration of the blood and checking out the products when they get there to make sure that the right type. The two checks and that yeah. kind of stuff. So, so it was a sort of a phased uh, educational approach to the system at large. 
So how are you transfusing it? I know in the ER you usually use those rapid transfusers. Are you just hanging it? Do you use TXA with any of this like massive hemorrhage protocol mm-hmm. stuff? So TXA is a great question. So <laughs> we rolled this out. Uh, it was a bit of partnership in, between Loudoun County and My Fairfax. military is showing. <laughs> Fair, Fairfax yeah. is uh, has done TXA for a little while. We have not in Loudoun. It's something I've been continuing to follow in terms of some of the studies on TXA. <laughs> and crash too. They're in crash too. Yeah. yeah it's it, it, They're back and forth. Uh, they're back and forth. And as, as, a, as an EMS physician, I know the burden of educating an entire group of, we've got probably between career and volunteer, about 850 mm-hmm. operational members. And so doing, doing an educational tra- training and implementing a protocol is, is a heavy lift. And again, I want to target stuff that I know is going to be effective and make a difference. And I think the data on TXA is is still to be determined. Some have been early adopters and are very supportive, and right. that's great. I've been sort of more uh, watching and considering at this point. Yeah. And so th- the point is, uh, Fairfax, they actually are using TXA. We are not. But in terms of administration, we went with a fluid warmer uh, called the Q-Inflow, which is a pretty amazing piece of equipment. because So it's battery powered, completely portable, very rugged. So it's really well suited to the EMS environment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Two firefighters and medics just dropping everything. And very simple. <laughs> you basically just turn it on. There's one button and all it does is heat fluids. And so it'll take cold blood or saline, if for some reason you want to infuse saline, um, you know, a hypothermic patient, for example. Sure. It'll take that, you know, almost freezing uh, fluid and warm it up to 38 degrees to, you know, just above body temperature, 39 degrees, and uh, instantly, basically. It's amazing. So it's not a pump. It just passively flows through it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a great piece of equipment. That's what we purchased. And and for that, you actually, so it can just gravity flow or you can pressure bag it. Okay. You could could basically run it in as fast as you can squeeze the bag. Right. So depending on how big your IV is and how much tubing length you have, you you can put fluid in pretty quick. And that's a much better system than us just putting it under our shirts in the wintertime in Boston to warm up fluids. Right. (laughs) What is cold? And as you know, (laughs) trauma patients, it's the trauma triad of death, hypothermia Mm -hmm. and coagulation. And so uh, keeping your trauma patients warm, super important. So warm IV fluids, if you are just going to give normal crystalloid, is, 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 is good. Um, but certainly the blood, I mean, it comes cold. It's not room temperature. It, right. It's chilly. It's and so cold. you don't want to do that to your trauma patients um, for sure. So, so the, having a good, robust fluid warmer was a, a big part of the program and a big part of the equipment. Uh, cost that, that got us this off the ground. Will you give like a 30 second explanation of TXA for anyone that doesn't know what it is? So transexemic acid. Transexemic acid is a, it, it's a procoagulant, and so it helps uh, in the clotting cascade and um, your, your trauma patients who are obviously bleeding um, internally. You know, the trauma uh, with hemorrhagic shock is, is is the leading cause of preventable death and trauma. Uh, we're lucky if they're bleeding out from something that we can constrict, i.e., put a tourniquet on. You know, yep. an extremity. That's, that's bleeding we can put a finger on and we can stop very, very easily. When it's internal, mm, then it gets tricky. And so right. we can't, you know, put a finger on a bleeding liver or spleen or bleeding into their chest. But medications like TXA that can help improve the likelihood of, of clotting uh, could be beneficial. Theoretically. Theoretically, right? The downside yeah. is you could cause a stroke or a pulmonary embolism or some mm-hmm. other complication. In or a heart attack, theory. yeah. And it's a risk-benefit calculation. Um, and again, the, the evidence is emerging on TXA and has been for some time. A lot of very interesting, compelling studies on it. So so we'll see. You know, I'm sure more to come on that that med- medication. Um, and, and my understanding as well as TXA is it's not just the bolus dose they get in the field. Um, they would potentially need to continue with the infusion when they get to the hospital. So it's not just what is EMS doing, but what's happening at the hospital when they arrive at the trauma center or is the right. trauma center continuing that treatment or not. Right. And so you, there needs to be good collaboration between yeah. the pre-hospital and the hospital team. And what are the trauma you know, right. on their patients ultimately that we're bringing to them? Are they going to be on board with this treatment or not? And so that's a very important piece of the puzzle as well. And there's some times where you're not going to continue the drip. This trauma surgeon says, and then some some providers will give it because they're further away yeah. and they're further away from getting to a trauma center. So it's kind of, um, I would say it's more subjective. And then we usually trauma surgeons will give the feedback to EMS saying, 
uh, you know, and they have a discussion. What were you thinking? What did you see? We didn't do this because we got this. We went to the OR. You know, there's so many different um, ways of looking at it. And I think with the factor program, we, with education, we've also done some mocks where Dr. Moore comes to the hospital, the call is made, then the nurse will come out of the trauma room with the warmer backpack and then lab will come. Someone will run down to lab, pick up the three boxes, and then bring it to the door. So we've done times to figure out how long it will take that. And I think we were to seven minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, seven it's, minutes. It's very fast, which, again, was a bit shocking because, again, having worked in the emergency department for many years, you would request blood and it might take some time. And so we were able to get the process down to, to such an expedited way. And we didn't we didn't talk much about what's in the components, but basically this is a massive transfusion protocol. So for, for folks who are familiar with the hospital setting, there's what's called a massive That's transfusion true. protocol yeah. where if somebody's really bleeding out or presents in hemorrhagic shock, you can request a very large amount of blood to be brought to the emergency department immediately for immediate transfusion. And so what we've got here is five units of pack cells, five units of uh, plasma, and, and, and a unit of platelets which is like five or six donors worth of platelets. So five, right. five, and five to make up that, you know, full complement of, of blood. This, the studies are showing that, you know, really just administering just packed red blood cells, more than a unit or two can start to cause some problems. You know, we don't bleed red cells, we bleed whole blood. Right. And giving back either whole blood or all of the components back in uh, approximately equal ratios is really actually very important. And so that one of the barriers to this process was this hospital, Nova Loudon, only had frozen plasma. So frozen uh, plasma is mm -hmm. nice for the blood bank because it lasts, you know, a year or two frozen, right. but it takes 45 minutes to thaw. And so that was a deal breaker where we can't wait around for 45 minutes for right. the plasma to thaw. So we were like, well, maybe we can thaw it while it's in route. You know, can we get some sort of, you right. know, super duper warmer that would work for EMS? But at the end of the day, we were able to collaborate with the blood bank at the hospital and get them to stock liquid plasma. So uh, it's ready okay. to go instantly. They don't, nothing's needed. They just pack it in the cooler and monitor its temperature. And so they were able to keep that on hand, which benefits the time. So we were able to get to those ridiculous, right. I mean, like literally from my phone call, I'll call the blood bank and seven or eight minutes later, the blood is in coolers by the EMS entrance ready to go, which is crazy fast. That's, and that's really insane. Yeah. And so we were able to demonstrate that that works not only here, but similar process at Inova Fairfax Hospital, their level one trauma center, same exact process. So we have two sites available to serve the population center of the Northern Virginia region. And so if those trauma patients are getting platelets and plasma early on, maybe they don't need something like TXA because they're potentially going to clot. Right. And the other Hopefully. thing I think is really an interesting piece to consider is, you know, you think about, oh, are we wasting blood by having it in the EMS setting where we need, you know, blood blood is in short supply and 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 we're constantly looking for, for more blood donors um, because of that. So we don't want to waste this important, precious resource but there's some suggestion that if we get blood to patients sooner who need it, they may actually need less blood product. Right. Ultimately, if you look at a trauma patient that, that consumes massive amounts of blood products throughout their entire course of hospitalization because they get coagulopathic and they acidotic. They saline fluid initially in the field. Yeah. And, right. yeah. Dilute. Because they get so <laughs> sick, they end up needing more. Right. Perhaps if we give them blood earlier on, we may avoid that. Now, that's theoretical. Really, this, you know, we want to make our decisions based on data. We want to see outcomes from Right. These right. agencies, these helicopter agencies that are using blood in the pre-hospital setting, we want to see them show improved outcomes to really feel that this, these pre-hospital EMS civilian blood programs will save lives like the military programs have shown they can. So that's still emerging. Um, and so I think there's a lot been a lot of some pushback within the EMS community about, is this a, the right thing to do? Does this make sense right. in terms of ultimately what we're all most interested in, which is improving outcomes? And so where's the program going from here? I don't want to take up too much of your time, but are you studying any of this? Have you been able to use this since that incident? So uh, we haven't had an incident yet. <laughs> right. uh, we haven't had a deployment, which is good. Which is good and and, right. and bad. I want to see it get used, but I'm you know obviously um, you don't want that situation. We don't want that situation to happen. We know it will come. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's been some nice corollary benefits in terms of now liquid plasma is available in the hospital setting. So if we Which, have somebody with a hemorrhagic yeah. stroke who's on yeah. blood thinners right. and needs FFP, but before we had to wait 45 minutes, now it's 
it available instantly. Instant, so there's been some yeah. side benefits to... It'll get used, yeah. So we were very, as a level three, there's certain um, blood components you don't have to have. And as we transitioned, we ended up getting every every single component. But it did end up being a factor when you have to thaw. Yeah. Usually level ones will have thawed FFP just because they use it so often and they are higher acuity. Here we did not have that opportunity. So this program benefited the patient's the EMS and the hospital. So it worked out well. And I think the other component that we've seen across the state and why um, some people can't have this happen is because they don't have uh, like a a local donor services. So I know donor services was able to focus with the region that we cover and we were able to do it in within like a year, year and a half is miraculous. Because if you're working with a national, they may, you you take the blood away from the trauma center and there's no blood left. Yeah. How are you going to supply it back? So the great thing about, I Nova Donor Services, they have a local, ours is seven miles away. So they, EMS can have the blood to treat the patient in the field, but we can get more blood quickly. So you're never going to lose any blood in the trauma centers because we're able to get it back in. But with that said, you have to have people who come out, like Dr. Morgan says, and donate. Right. Yeah. So when right. blood is being given to Inova Donor Services, it's kind of going back into the community, which benefits the patient and the community, but it also helps us try to treat the patients better. And obviously better outcomes in trauma patients when you give blood earlier on than saline, which is huge. So um, we would love people to come out and donate, which is huge for us to be able to successfully save lives, yeah. especially in the trauma population. So I think people don't realize how much blood get can get used, even just from one car accident with one victim, they'll go through, you know, 50 units of blood products. Yeah. And so that's a lot. And, and they're, they're kind of constantly short in short supply and they always <laughs> need donors. And one of the, I think, side benefits of this program as well was just increase, increasing awareness, you know, whether that's from the community, even from the fire rescue community, from mm-hmm. our personnel, uh, EMS providers to to say, hey, I, I see the benefits of this, and I'm willing to take take time out of my life, you know, once every couple months and, and donate. Yeah. So so we're hopeful that that will increase awareness and increase and in, in, in boost the blood supply uh, right. as well. And and we're looking at things, uh, you know, we're looking at whole blood. I mean, whole bloods. Mm-hmm conceptually just makes a lot of sense. That's what what we did in the military. We had walking blood banks. You drew from one soldier and 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 you could just immediately administer if everyone's pre-screened the walking blood bank coordinated it all. Yeah. So blood is, is currently, you know, put into its components for, for convenience and for storage reasons. And also because a lot of it goes to maybe cancer patients who really just need one specific type or the other, uh, depending right. on what they're, they're, they're short of. But in the trauma situation, you bleed whole blood, you need whole blood back. And there's some benefits to, uh, to the use of whole blood. There's some, some challenges as well um, in terms of, you know, potential reactions with the donors, white cells and some things like that, that, that may be problematic. But again, we're talking about people who are basically fixing to die if they don't get blood. And so some of these sort of theoretical concerns about right. the risks of blood transfusion kind of go out the window. If you're looking at this is life or death here, um, we're going to just give it and, and, and see if it makes a difference. Yeah. That's the military standpoint of there's no other choice. Might as well just try something. And I think, and then it works. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> you know, some trauma centers have been asking us because I know we sent the video because the video is wonderful and the, our emergency room got the video so everyone understands why it's so important. But other trauma centers are like, oh, well, how is it going to work? How is it going to work? So for us to be the leaders in doing this for our community is huge, which also if we do have the great success of great outcomes with this program, then we hope it takes and kind of goes. Yeah. Because I think you think local, you think region, but then it ultimately you want it nationally because pre-hospital and trauma centers, when it comes to trauma patients, we just want the best outcomes and the survival of those patients. And did we do everything we could to care for them? And I think this is a huge step locally in our region that could become natural, n- national, kind of what we do in the Absolutely. military. Yeah. So, and you said it's cheaper for EMS to implement because the blood's being stored, not on their vehicles, it's being stored at the hospital. So that's for smaller agencies, you know, I'm sure that would be much easier for them to get started as well. Yeah. And the partnership is really, I think, creates opportunities. Even if you think about a forward deployed blood program, say with whole blood in our region, it still makes sense to say, okay, well, rather than EMS just owning that blood and then throwing it away at the end of a few weeks when it's gone bad, why don't they just hold on to it for a week and have it rotate back into the hospital? Right. So if, if you're partnered with a blood banking organization like a 
hospital or blood donor services, it creates a lot of efficiencies and I think could re eliminate, reduce waste of, of these precious blood products. Um, so there's, it, it, it opens up some, some interesting opportunities, I think, that we might see in the future. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm sure I could keep asking you questions for hours about this because this is absolutely fascinating. And I'm so grateful for you guys to come out or from let me to come out and speak with you. But of course, we want to plug blood donation uh, before we go. So you guys are mentioning your great community resource. I will say that anyone listening all around the world, go donate blood. I'm sure they need it wherever you are as well. Uh, whatever state you're in, they probably need blood too. And it doesn't matter your blood type. If you have a specific blood type that's not a universal donor, great. They'll use that on someone they've screened in the hospital that's not a <laughs> critical um Patient. So what is your Anova Donor Services? What is what are they about? Where can people find them? I think they want it to be more of pay it forward, right? You sit there at your house and you say, What can I do? I'm sitting here, I'm watching the screen and I'm seeing all people. this extra blood. Correct, right? <laughs> what can I do? So when you're sitting there watching the TVs and you're seeing you know, something traumatic happening, like shooting at uh, elementary or anything like that, you ask yourself, what can I do? What you can do is pay it forward. Everyone needs blood some way, somehow. So if you're able to save a life by knowing you've gone into donor services, locally it's Inova Donor Services, you can go in, give that blood, and then you can save someone's life. And I think that's paying it forward in a way that is something that people don't think. It's thinking outside the box. Right. So I think that's huge. And then of course, um, one single donor, help, uh, one single donation helps three lives. So again, it's not just one to one, it's also three other lives that you can save. So I think that's huge. It's just getting up and going there and finding out and then being able to know that you save lives every day. You don't have to have, uh, go to school to do that. That's kind of, <laughs> you know, you ask yourself, you know, they're like, oh, nurses and doctors and, and Clintex and pre-hospital, they all save lives. You can save a life too. And that's where people don't think. Yeah. And there's no student loans with it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you get a card. <laughs> yes. And we had just released the episodes about the Boston Marathon bombing for my listeners. And a lot of those runners went right to Mass General or the local blood banks and donated even after the marathon. So, I mean, if those guys can do it, then, <laughs> then you can donate as well. And I think it helped a lot of those runners feel like they were contributing to this massive event that just happened. So you can do that whenever you're feeling like you want to help. And that's a great way of looking at it, paying it forward. So is there anything else that you guys want to touch on before we wrap up? No, I think I, I think it's just, let's watch and see. I think great things are going to happen. I think the partnership is huge. This was a huge partnership that you don't get to see across the nation. I think we keep on working together with training each other. EMS trains nurses and we train EMS. So we want to see it grow. And I think this is just a stepping stone of where we're going to go. So. We're, we're all working towards the same ultimate goals to benefit the patients. And if we get things, uh, you know, right in the pre-hospital setting, it makes their job easier in the hospital. And ultimately, their goals are, are the same as ours in terms of outcomes. So we're, 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 it's a good partnership. Well, thank you guys again for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, anyone that wants to get in touch with me, they can reach out to antidotespodcast at gmail.com. Facebook is Antidote Stories and Medicine Podcast. Of course, Twitter is Antidotes Pod and Instagram is Antidotes Podcast. So again, thank you to Peter Hopkins, our custom intro music, and we will see you all next week. Have a good one. 